When my mom was first diagnosed with cancer, she became a born-again Christian. But back in the 90s, she was all into the New Age stuff and has told me and my sister that if it was possible, she'd contact us from the afterlife to prove that there was something after this. When the breast cancer came back the second time, this time metastasized into her lungs in stage 4, she decided she couldn't face chemo and all that again for a less than 50% chance of not beating it, but only extending her time. But she did extend her prognosis by moving to Colorado and using therapies there to keep her weight up. After three years, the decline couldn't be stopped and she came home to Alabama September 2017 to make memories with everyone and set affairs in order. She was there for my wedding in Texas. We all had a last Christmas together with lots of laughing and pictures. She taught me how to make jelly and can it. June 2018, Mom started telling my sister and Dad about the shadow people that she had started seeing. She would see them in the yard, or they would move through the rooms of the house as if the walls were not there, sometimes standing by her for a period of time before walking off. They weren't frightening or scary to her, she just wondered why they were there. My sister speculated that for my mom, the veil, or whatever separates the living from the dead, was getting thin but her approach to it was so gradual she might be seeing through it. Mom passed three months later in September, and at first when I saw her in my dreams it was leaving me very stressed out and distraught when I woke up, and I hadn't told anyone but my husband. I was trying to tough through it on my own. Then there was another dream. Mom sitting at the kitchen table, not talking but just hanging out, and two of her sisters came over. My Aunt R was headed to sit at the table in the chair Mom was in, but right before reaching went, Oops, can't take that one. B is there. I was shocked and said, You can see her? And Aunt R laughed and said, Yeah, of course I can. She's visiting all of us. After that, when I woke up, I called my Aunt R and after beating around the bush a little, I asked if she was having dreams with my mom and she was. Then I found out so were my sisters and my dad. But so far, mom didn't talk in mine. She was telling my dad to go places and giving advice and those sorts of things to others. I became less stressed and saddened by her presence in my dreams. Two months ago, mom came to me in a dream and told me I needed to go see my grandmother, her mother, soon. She didn't say why, she just said I needed to and to do it soon and soon was very pressed upon. Then this dream I called my oldest sister to tell her about it and I started crying on the phone with her which is what woke me up with tears still on my cheeks. So the first thing I do is complete the dream and call my sister and tell her about it so she can go visit granny. It's not as easy for me living a thousand miles away. Last month my sister tells me Granny's mind is now slipping pretty regularly. For example, she went to three yard sales with my aunt and bought stuff at all three. Then they went out to eat lunch and someone mentions maybe they will see some more yard sales after lunch. Granny says, yeah, maybe we'll find one now. Ain't seen a single one all day. And she wasn't joking. These last two weeks, Granny started having breathing distress and was in the hospital for a week. Now she's been released to home hospice. I'm flying back this week. My mom only spoke up in my dreams to warn me and it came true pretty fast. She always told us if she could bring us proof of the afterlife, she would and to me, she has. These stories were all told to me by my stepmom and she's okay with me retelling them. All of these stories take place over 20 years ago and she hasn't had anything like what she had shared with me since. So back when my stepmom was a little girl around 8 years old, she lived in Mexico with her parents and 5 other siblings. My stepmom is the eldest and because of that she shared her room with the babies of her family. One night, she explained how she was woken up randomly and saw these two little kids holding hands and standing right next to her bed. She said that they were see-through and that they just stared at her, unmoving. 
She was terrified, but didn't make a noise as to not wake her siblings and instead remain frozen in place. After a while, she blinked and they just vanished as if though they weren't there. She went back to sleeping, brushing it off, and in the morning, she didn't say a word to her parents. Over the course of a few weeks, she started seeing glimpses of the two kids throughout her house, but it was always out of the corner of her eye. On one morning, she was in the kitchen helping her siblings get some breakfast when she looked up and saw the kids right by her youngest baby brother. She immediately grabbed what was closest to her, a wooden spoon, and launched herself at the kids shouting at them to leave her brother alone. They disappeared and her siblings were all confused as none of them had seen it. She told them it was alright though and continued on with her day. Eventually she said she had started to see them almost every night. She'd wake up from dreams she couldn't remember and see them staring down at her, their faces void of any emotion but always holding hands. She tried telling them to go away and leave her family alone and they'd disappear only to come back at night. Eventually one day she saw them actually move and reach a hand out towards her mother. She screamed at them to not touch her mother and they snapped their heads to look at my stepmom. She stood her ground and told them to leave her mother alone and they vanished again. Her mother quickly started asking her what the problem was and she explained what she had been seeing. Her mother instantly freaked out and told her father what happened. As soon as he heard, they took my stepmom out of the house and to her aunts. They didn't say anything but that they'd bring her siblings with them and that they'd be staying with their aunt for a bit. My stepmom later learned that when her mother was pregnant with her, she had seen the same kids and they had tried to touch her stomach, where my stepmom was still unborn. After her mother gave birth to my stepmom, she stopped seeing them. So when my stepmom told her mother how she had been seeing these kids, she freaked out. They ended up calling for a priest and eventually moved out of that house. Just a couple of years later, they moved to the United States and everything was fine. My stepmom explained how she remembered occasionally seeing people wandering around looking lost, but that she could see through them. She ignored it and after a few years she stopped seeing them. Fast forward quite a few years to when my stepmom was single and had her three kids, all still very young, babies and toddlers. She lived two houses down from her parents' house where some of her brothers were currently staying. During the time she lived, she always felt that someone was watching her, and she just felt this really angry atmosphere around her. She explained it like trying to relax, but stuck being tense. She didn't live in that house long, and here's the reason why. On the last night she slept there, she woke up to something or someone pushing down on her chest. She kept trying to get up or throw her arms at whatever was pushing down on her, but her hands just kept hitting air. She struggled for a few minutes just feeling this weight on her continuously pushing until she suddenly was able to throw herself upright. She immediately got out of bed and grabbed her kids and ran down to her parents' house. She frantically knocked on the door until her brothers opened it up and let her in. They were worried and asked what was wrong. They had never seen my stepmom so scared before. She's the kind of person who won't hesitate to fight someone to protect people and doesn't take nonsense from anybody. She also helped raise her siblings, so they've always seen her so strong for them. She explained what happened and told them she refused to go back in that house. Her brothers led her to sit down and she made sure her kids were alright, and that's when one of her brothers noticed that she had this huge bruise on her chest. She went to the bathroom to look in the mirror and sure enough, there was this large bruise that looked like misshapen hands. She spent the night with her kids and in the morning she explained to her parents what happened. She still refused to go back to the house and her brothers ended up moving everything out of the house for her. She moved somewhere else and to this day she still hasn't set foot anywhere near the house and refuses to get close. She has no idea who the owners, if any of them, had any sort of experience like she did. She just blatantly refuses to have anything to do with that house. She told the story to my dad once and he tried to say it was sleep paralysis, but she vividly remembers being able to move around, just unable to get up, and she had multiple witnesses to the bruise she got from it. 
She won't talk much about it, but swears something evil is definitely living in that house. This took place when I was in college, so in my early 20s. One of my classes offered a trip overseas for a couple of weeks. The girl I was interested in at the time was going, so I naturally jumped at the chance to go as well. In general, the trip was pretty uneventful, but still enjoyable. The girl, Jen, and I spent much of the time getting to know one another, taking in the sights and throwing around some subtle flirting. It was the day before we were scheduled to go back home that everything that could go wrong did. It started off as normal any other day. We had decided to go to a popular bar nearby with some of the locals that a few of us had made friends with as a going back home party. On the way, I happened to spot a shady looking guy bumping into someone on the edge of a crowd. My eye was drawn to him, just long enough to spot him sneak up and steal something from someone's bag while they were distracted. My sense of justice kicked in and I figured I'd show off in front of Jen by taking down a pickpocket. I strode over quickly and exclaimed, Hey! Just before reaching out and grabbing him by the shoulder. He swung around, lashing out wildly with both fists, managing to strike me across the right eye and the right side of my nose. I stumbled backwards and ended up falling on my tailbone, which was quite painful. The thief took off and disappeared into the crowd as witnesses flagged down some nearby policemen. I did my best to describe the guy. Dark hair, five o'clock shadow, black hat, tan coat, blue jeans. I didn't get a good look at his face and he was long gone, so there wasn't much that they could do other than keep an eye out and see if he came back later. We continued on to the bar and I slumped down in my seat with my bruised face, but an ego. About half of our local friends were concerned about the encounter, the other half finding it amusing, which ended up causing some friction for a short while. Luckily, peace was restored with the introduction of alcohol. The cute barmaid even brought me a cold compress for my face, which had begun to swell already. I tried my best to keep the chemistry going with Jen, and the situation seemed to improve with every shot we took, so we kept taking them. Eventually, I realized that I was starving, so I ordered a dish that was the local take on nachos. In my drunken state, I claimed that it was probably the best thing that I've ever tasted. It had some kind of spice meat that wasn't beef and was loaded with onions, which I love. I offered some to Jen, but she looked repulsed, saying she hated how strong the onion smell was. I decided that it would be super funny if I asked if my breath was bad, then exhaled in her face. She covered her mouth and nose while pushing herself away from me, saying that she needed to use the restroom before leaving. I just shrugged it off and kept eating. After a while, I noticed that she hadn't come back yet. I started to feel anxious, so I said that I was going to the restroom. On the way, I spotted her sitting in another booth and smiling. My heart sank as I saw three guys who looked to be in their early to mid-twenties sitting with her, one of them with his arm around her shoulders the other two sitting opposite from them. I felt hot under the collar as I walked up and just stood next to them. It took a little under a minute for her to notice me, looking surprised before saying, Oh, Kyle, um, these guys are... Creep 1, 2, and 3. They're musicians. She gushed, and my stomach turned. Uh, Jen, can I talk to you for a minute? I asked. She opened her mouth for a fraction of a second, but Creep One pulled her closer and said, Hey, come on, don't go. We can talk here. Jen looked a little unsure. Uh, is it important? She inquired. It's about Judy. Our safe phrase for getting out of bad situations. Jen looked concerned, but Creep One butted in again. Well, I'll tell you what. You can take Judy to the hospital or wherever she needs to go, and... We'll make sure uh, this little miss gets home safe, he said while giving Jen a slight shake. It sounded as if this idiot couldn't even remember her name. I was a bit relieved when Jen was able to shrug his arm off while she shook her head, but it was short-lived. Wait, wait, wait. Is Judy here? She asked while looking up at me and lowering her hands to touch the table she was sitting at. 
My eyes darted to each of the guys, all of them sitting up a little more and sharing looks like they were silently communicating. I looked back at Jen and nodded. She scoffed at me and said, No, wait, actually, no. No, 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 it's fine. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. You can look after Judy. In a terse, dismissive tone. I opened my mouth to protest, but the look on her face as she folded her arms said it all. I was defeated. Creep One was now grinning smugly at me as his arm draped over her shoulders again, turning his head to smile at her as she did the same. I went back to our table to drown my sorrows, leaning over into the aisle every so often to look at their booth. It was out of sight if I was sitting up straight. At some point, Creep One had gone to get more drinks and now had her boxed in between himself and the wall on the other side of the booth. I grew more and more frustrated as the night progressed. Another time I checked on them, it seemed like she was trying to refuse to take another shot, but he kept scooting it closer and closer towards her until he got fed up and pressed the edge of the glass to her lips, smiling and speaking softly to her until she reluctantly downed it. His buddies clapped and he kissed her on the cheek. I shot up out of my seat and stormed over. It appeared as if Jen looked a little relieved as I approached. Creep One noticed her looking and followed her gaze. Ah, it's Amy, all right then? He asked, sounding less enthused about my return. Judy, and it looks like it might be more serious than we feared. You should really come with me, Jen. Once again, Creep One spoke up. What's with all this? Is he your keeper or your boyfriend or something? Jen looked kind of flustered and out of it while mumbling. I, I, uh, uh. this was it. He had just given me the ammo I needed. I was about to bark yes, sweep Jen away from these scumbags and make sure we both got home safe and sound. No, Jen said flatly. I rocked in place, her eyes raised from looking at the table to meet mine. No, she repeated softly. I was truly finished now. The next half an hour or so felt unreal. I wallowed in my misery while grazing on my nachos and sipping at any drink that was within arm's reach, regardless if it was mine or not. I was only snapped out of it by an ear-piercing scream, some shouting and the shuffling of many feet. I stumbled over to the forming crowd and saw a man lying on the floor, the bartender pressing a rag down on his throat. Was he strangling him? People weren't stopping him and they were shouting for an ambulance to be called. The man was shaking as they rolled him onto his side. Then I saw blood coming out of his mouth and nose. It turns out that he had shown up to confront his cheating girlfriend, who had been seeing a guy who was known to be bad news. The bad guy saw him coming and, I suppose expecting a fight, broke a bottle and preemptively slashed the man across the throat before fleeing out the back through the kitchen. I watched as paramedics showed up and took over. They got him stable enough to move before taking off with him. Quite a few people left the bar after the ambulance. It felt so somber. The rest of our group was discussing how tragic it was and how we should probably leave soon. A light clicked on in my mind. I hadn't checked on Jen in nearly an hour. I had sat facing away from their booth to keep myself from looking, in case I saw something that would make me even more miserable but making sure she was safe was now back at the top of my priorities. I spun from my sitting position to my feet, wobbling drunkenly before striding to the other side of the bar with as much confidence as I could muster. My breathing stopped completely when I saw that the booth was empty. I looked around frantically, but saw no sign of them. I checked the bathrooms, both male and female. As I came out, I asked a nearby waiter if he had saw where the people from that booth went. He said that the four of them left already. He had called them a cab a little while ago. I rushed outside. The street was nearly empty, no cabs in sight. One of my classmates came out and asked me if something was wrong. I told her everything, saying that we should call the police or try to track Jen's phone somehow or something. I was panicking hard and my breath was coming in short, rapid gasps. She took me back inside, sat me down, and we all discussed it. They were all pretty much under the consensus that she just went home with the local guy and we'd be back in the morning. If not, we would file a report. 
I straight up told them that they had all lost their minds. Jen could be on her way to a ton of terrible things, like human trafficking or organ harvesting, and their plan was to wait and see. They accused me of being overly dramatic and too drunk to think clearly. I left the booth to go sit at the bar. I stayed there, helplessly perched on a stool for a while before the group told me that they were heading out and asked if I wanted to ride with them. I refused, saying that I would call a cab or something when the bar was about to close. I was staring down at the bar, my head in my hands and on the verge of tears when I saw a drink slide into view. I looked up and saw the cute barmaid with a sympathetic smile on her face. She glanced from side to side, I guess to make sure her boss wasn't watching and murmured, it's on the house. I smiled weakly as I drew it closer and sipped on the straw a little. It was horrible, wasn't it? What happened? She said while staring at the part of the floor where the man had been lying after he was attacked. I nodded silently, my mind still on Jen. You know, I get off in about an hour. I'd feel a lot safer if I had someone to walk me home. It's just a few blocks from here. She continued. Even while that wasted, I could tell when a movie is to be made. I smiled and agreed, setting the rest of my drink aside, thinking that I should at least attempt to sober up as I could before attempting to get lucky. About 45 minutes later, she came back to me and said that she was just going to get her stuff from her locker and to meet her at the front door. I used the restroom one more time before doing so and we left together. She mostly talked about how seeing that man almost losing his life made her feel like she needed to live life more, be more outgoing and try new things. I mostly tried to walk straight and keep from burping obnoxiously, the nachos from before giving me heartburn and indigestion. We were a couple of blocks away from the bar when we rounded a corner and I was suddenly jerked into a dark alleyway by my arm. I came face to face with scruffy facial hair, not quite a beard, a knit cap and a turtleneck. He was holding a knife close to my chest. Give me what you got, he demanded, then pointed the knife at the barmaid. You too. She looked shocked for a moment, then took off. Lucky me. He slugged me in the stomach. I panicked, thinking I had just been stabbed, but thankfully it just punched me. Unfortunately, that was the only motivation needed for the bar nachos and all the alcohol I had consumed that night to come spewing out of my body. The mugger, and his friend that I was just now noticing, made sounds of disgust as they danced away from the puddle of vomit forming under me. It burned coming up and made it difficult to breathe. I seriously felt like I would pass out at one point as I would try to inhale, only to have another wave of puke surge from my mouth. They took this opportunity to rifle through my jacket and pockets as I fruitlessly tried to bat them away. They got my keys, which I didn't need at the time, but it was still aggravating. My phone and my wallet. I had luckily left my passport with my stuff at the place I was staying. I received a few insults as well as a couple of more kicks to the stomach and ribs from them before they departed. A perfect way to end this night, I thought to myself while getting to my feet, wiping my vomit-cumbered hands with a newspaper I picked up from the ground before making my way to a nearby payphone. I called a cab. I had some loose change in my pockets from the phone. I kept coughing and clearing my throat as it burned. My face and sides and lower back all ached and or throbbed. I just wanted today to be over and to skip ahead to when I wouldn't feel like complete and utter garbage. I'd have my stuff back and Jen would be safe. The cab took me to where my friend and I were staying, this little shop that a kind elderly couple owned and would rent out the place above it to people visiting. I couldn't pay of course so the driver followed me upstairs where I asked my friend to spot me the fare. I obliged and said I would pay him back when I could. I couldn't even be bothered to call and have my cards cancelled. I just wanted to pass out and forget this nightmarish day. I laid in bed, drifting on the edge of sleep before a cramp rippled through my stomach. I groaned and clutched my abdomen before rushing to the bathroom and having the worst case of the runs I'd ever had before or since. To top it all off, my nose started bleeding again during this, so I had to twist up a square of toilet paper and shove it up my hemorrhaging nostril. Sleep finally took me over after I got back into bed, and I'd never been more grateful. I awoke the next morning and just laid in bed, 
dreading what new horrors would befall me as I recovered from the previous ones. After a few minutes, I realized that I didn't even have the slightest bit of a hangover. I rolled out of bed to use my bathroom, only to stop in front of the mirror. There was no evidence that my face had been double-punched yesterday. Hope welled up inside of me as I did a quick search of my possessions. Wallet, keys, and phone, all accounted for. Impossible, I thought. I mean, I've had dreams every so often of very brief, fleeting moments, but they were always just little snippets of time of very mundane things. Stuff like segments of a conversation while riding in a car with friends, or staring down at my ketchup-covered fries while overhearing a conversation at another table. It had never been an entire day, and I certainly didn't live those dreams before they came to pass. You're not supposed to be able to feel pain during a dream, and I felt quite a bit of pain. I decided that there was nothing to do but roll with it. I got a free do-over, I guess. I wasn't going to complain about the terrible day I just had. The smallest details would come to me right before they happened. I found myself muttering other people's lines under my breath before they said them, like I was watching a movie that I had completely memorized. It was surreal. I could remember everything I did in response and would try to reenact my part for the day, up until the moment when I saw the pickpocket. At first I thought I'd just ignore him, but that was a no-go on my moral compass. Plan B was to just call him out, but keep my distance. I didn't want to get punched again. I don't know if I'm stupid or just stubborn, but I wanted to nail this guy for what he was doing and what he had done to me. I opted for walking up behind him quickly and tugging the collar on his jacket down the middle of his back, keeping his arms from reaching up past a certain point. I yanked him back so he fell before restraining him with his jacket with one hand and my other hand on the back of his neck, keeping him from struggling free as he flailed and yelled at me. I shouted for police, knowing that they were already in the area, and they showed up in seconds. He was still struggling, shouting, and swearing as I told them that I saw him stealing and he was searched, turning up at least half a dozen wallets and other personal items that were clearly not all his. They cuffed him and thanked me as they dragged him away. Our group joked that I was secretly a vigilante for the rest of the night, and it kind of became a thing that rarely came up for the next couple of years or so. I was just glad the guy was off the streets and that my face was still pretty. The story of my heroism was told and retold to our local friends, as well as anyone who would listen once my classmates drank enough. This time when it came to drinks I just stuck with my beer every so often, and for food I would nibble on a couple of crackers from the snack platter on our table. I didn't want any risk of this stuff coming back to haunt me. Jen took notice after her second round of shots and asked why I was being so reserved in my consumption. I replied that I perform better when I'm not a sloppy drunk and my stomach isn't full of greasy bar food. Her eyebrows shot up and her mouth opened slightly in shock. I thought I may have gone too far with that comment and she would think I assumed she was loose, but she laughed it off and said, Well, all right then, hotshot. We'll see. I breathed a sigh of relief. I just had to keep things light and I might get the happy ending I was aiming for. Jen took to eating a little here and there, as well as switching to beer. Things were going well, then Jen said that she had to use the restroom. I remember where this went last time, resolving to get up and follow her just a few short minutes after her to try and steer her away from the creeps that were surely sitting on the other side of the bar. I sat and waited bouncing my leg impatiently as I watched the doorway and tried to count slowly in my head. I got up when I couldn't take it anymore and had just taken a couple of steps before, surprisingly, Jen reappeared, looking confused and disturbed. I walked over, telling her that I was on the way to the restroom as well before asking her if something was wrong. Oh yeah, it's nothing, just some creeps tried to get me to sit with them while I was on the way back, she said, avoiding looking at me and rubbing her arm. I asked if that was all. She shuddered and said that one of them had grabbed her arm, not enough to hurt, but firmly enough that she had to tug it away. My blood boiled. I'll talk to them. I growled and walked past her before she could respond. There they were, smiling, drinking, and laughing while talking about who knows what. 
I was brimming with confidence now that Jen was on my side, so I didn't hesitate when I brought my hand down and slammed it on the table right in front of Creep 1, causing all of them to jump and spill their drinks a little. I quickly leaned down and got in his face before calmly ordering, Keep your hands to yourself. Maintaining eye contact for almost a minute as he kept glancing at his friends, all three of them at a loss for words. They seemed rather subdued when I emerged from the bathroom, avoiding looking at me as they cleaned themselves and the table with some napkins. Jen grinned upon my return, as did I. At that moment, I felt like I had cleared all of last night's hurdles. The merriment of the night continued while Jen and I grew more comfortable with each other. It was during a round of local drinking songs that for some reason almost all sound was drowned out. All sound except for the distinct creak and thud of the bar's door leading to the outside. I turned my head, and there he was, the man who had gotten his throat slashed by the guy with the bottle. I got up without excusing myself, watching as the man craned his neck, searching for his girlfriend. He had just spotted her near the back of the bar and began to head over when I stepped into his path and put my hand on his chest. He was a lot bigger up close, taller than me, much broader than me, could possibly toss me around like a rag doll. I could see why Bottle Guy didn't want to fight him fairly. His heavy brow furrowed as he looked down and saw me. What do you want? He began. I interrupted with, She's not worth it. He looked shocked and confused, and then angry. I started to worry as he was looking for her and Bottle Guy to me, then back to her, drawing in short breaths and exhaling loudly like he was working himself up. I stood my ground until his expression changed to hurt and heartache, clenching his jaw and swallowing before he looked back to me and just nodded stiffly. He slowly turned and left the bar with his head hung low. I felt rather sorry for him, but it was better than the alternative. Jen questioned me upon my return, but I simply replied, I had to stop a fight. I thought that it would be smooth sailing for the rest of the night, but there was one last little bump. As our group was getting ready to leave, I noticed the three creeps looking over frequently. As I helped Jen out of the booth, she stumbled a bit and leaned on me for support while laughing at her clumsiness. Shortly after she regained her balance, I felt someone slip past me, and then I saw Creep 2 take her by the arm. Thanks, mate. We'll make sure she gets home, he said before trying to lead her towards Creep 1 and 3, who were standing in the doorway leading to the other side of the bar. Jen looked shocked but still managed to yank her arm out of his grasp, causing him to look shocked as well. What are you talking about? She snapped. His confused look flashed the frustration, then settled into a smile as he said, Come on, hon. You're mad. We were just making sure you get home safe. Jen glared. I'm fine, thank you very much. She spat back at him. His eyes narrowed, but before he could address her again, I stepped in the way. I was a little taller than the guy, not quite as muscular, but... Our group of friends was still milling about around us, only a couple of them taking notice of the situation. Look, just let us take the girl. You don't want this fight, friend. Creep 2 said in a low, menacing tone, his two buddies stepping closer. I gave him a flat, emotionless smile. Fight? I asked loudly, causing the rest of our group to stop talking and I felt them gather behind me. What fight, friend? I asked, watching him shrink back slowly as he was confronted by about 16 people. He and his friends were severely outnumbered, as well as a couple of the locals we knew were big burly dock workers so they naturally backed down. They seethed and muttered obscenities that I only caught a few of as they retreated back to the other side of the bar. I asked other local pals to keep them occupied for a few minutes while we were all outside and filling into cabs. I was later told that the creeps were in a bit of a hurry to get to a cab as the one Jen and I were in was taking off and then shouting about being illegally detained once we were around the corner, but we were pretty much home free at that point. I guess their last ditch effort was to follow and possibly jump us when we got out of the cab. Idiots. I had asked the friend that I was bunking with to make himself scarce for the night, to which he agreed informing me that he had made plans with another local girl. 
Jen adored the warm, cozy place we were renting from the old couple, and I got my happy ending. Just me and Jen in a bed by candlelight. We're married now, and we agree that it was one of the most passionate nights we've ever had together. I'm glad that when I woke up the next morning, I found Jen in my arms, rather than the day being rewound again. To compound the strangeness of the events that took place, the guy I had prevented from getting his throat cut met me later in life, and is now one of my co-workers and best friends. He makes appearances in a few other stories, which I will get to eventually. I'm an 18-year-old female who now lives with my fiancé. When we first started dating, he had just moved to Maryland from Seattle, so his house was new to him. A week after we started seeing each other, he told me he heard tapping on his bedroom wall. It seemed to happen at least once a week. He would report hearing footsteps in the hallway or more tapping on the wall. Once I started sleeping over at his place, the activity increased. It started with hearing footsteps out in the hallway. Just to get an idea of how disturbing this is, the hallway outside of his room is tile and we would hear the sound of bare feet slapping on the tile when we knew no one else was in the house. Late one night, I had gone to the bathroom, which was down the hall. I didn't bother to turn the hall light on, so I didn't find it strange when I saw a large black shadow in front of the laundry room. I assumed that it was just the drying rack and paid it no attention. About an hour later, I went to the bathroom again, only to see that the shadow was gone. I asked my fiancé if he had gotten up to move the drying rack, to which he looked confused and asked, What drying rack? I told him when I had gone to the bathroom that I had seen a shadow in front of the laundry room and he turned white. He assured me he hadn't even done laundry that day. This shadow figure prompted me to look up my fiancé's address on the website diedinhouse.com. This search revealed that a man had died in the house in 2010 who I will just call Robert, to protect his family's privacy. As a joke, whenever something would go bump in the night, we began to call out, Robert, knock it off. However, whatever was in that house did not like being called Robert, because after we began to use this name, the activity began to get scary. Instead of quiet footsteps, we began to hear running coming down the stairs to our bedroom door. Doors to closets began to open, Lights would turn on by themselves, and my fiancé's dog began to growl at night. This was especially unsettling because these dogs never growl at anything, besides other dogs. One particularly scary experience was when I awoke late one night while my fiancé was sleeping. The hall light was on and was shining underneath the door. I heard the footsteps coming down the stairs and to my horror, I also saw two shadows appear underneath the door as if someone was standing in front of the door. The shadow eventually moved away just before the hall light clicked off by itself. The breaking point came one night when I was staying at my own house and my fiancé and I had fallen asleep on FaceTime. Around 3 in the morning, a horrible screeching, growling sound woke me up. The sound was so loud it hurt my ears. I thought it was my speaker next to my bed malfunctioning, so I ripped out the power cord. However... The sound didn't stop. I then realized that it was coming from my phone, which was still on FaceTime. I turned my phone volume all the way down, but the sound was still unbearable. So I figured it was a glitch of some sort and hung up the video call and went back to sleep. The next morning, my fiancé called me in a panic, telling me about how he had woken up at 3 in the morning, hearing this horrible screeching sound, only he couldn't move. He was stuck in a sleep paralysis episode. He heard the ding of the FaceTime call ending while the screeching continued. He said it was so loud it felt like it was inside his skull. While in his sleep paralysis, he saw hooded figures around his room whispering. I felt sick and told him that the sound had woken me up too, but was especially freaked out since it had continued in his room even after I had ended the call. After this incident, my fiancé and his mother saged the entire house. After the sage, the activity came to a screeching halt. Now we occasionally hear footsteps, but nothing nearly as terrifying as it was before. 
We're about to move to a new house, and I just hope there isn't any malevolent spirits in this house that we will have to deal with. When I had first moved into my medium-sized home, everything had seemed so calm and peaceful. My family as well as our animals seemed to like it. I had yet to notice anything which I now find odd with my own ability to see the paranormal, I should have seen what was yet to come. We moved my little brother into the room directly above the front door. He was happy to have such a big room. Now skip to a few weeks of living there, my brother had been waking up screaming and crying almost every night since the move, and that had my mother worried. But seeing the look on her face, I felt she knew something I didn't. Sick of the sleepless nights and having to get up to comfort him, we decided to switch him in my little sister's room. In the middle of the process, I noticed the dresser was pushed up against the closet door. I pushed it out of the way and my mother finally broke down admitting the closet door had been opening by itself and rattling when I wasn't home. I immediately opened the door and reached inside feeling the ice cold air. However I didn't want to frighten her more so I kept a straight face and continued to help move the rooms. Little did I know what was to come that night that I was meant to babysit. It's around 10pm, everything seemed fine. I was playing black ops zombies with my best friend in the basement, then the screaming and crying started. I jolted up bringing my phone, my friend and I were on a call. My little brother E was hysterical, yet my little sister and grandmother, sleeping on the couch visiting for the weekend, had not woken up to the loud cries. I tried to comfort him and brought him into his room sitting him on his bed when I noticed the closet door was wide open. I closed the door and sat beside him to further calm down while texting my mom to see if she had maybe left the door open. Three minutes later, he seemed to sleep and still no response from my mom. So I slid his wooden easel against the closet door, so if it opened I would be able to hear the bang. Now I'm back halfway down the basement stairs to resume my games when my mom texts me that she had left it open and asking why, then it happened. The bang and the scream started while my call to my friend dropped suddenly. I remember distinctively this moment. I remember the negative energy consuming me as soon as I ran into his bedroom. I remember feeling the heaviness and screaming too. I was freezing cold. I remember yelling for him to stop crying. I felt this evil until I carried him down to the living room where my grandma had slept, as if we weren't hysterical, as if she was in another dimension than us. Same as my little sister, sound asleep. After we calmed down, I put a movie on for him, just deciding to wait for my mom to get home when I noticed the time, 3.01am. I was too freaked out to really notice the ticking sound of some plastic hitting the wall. How did I not realize the time? Everything was seemingly normal by the time my mom got home moments later when she pointed out that the thermostat meter was open and asked if I was playing with the heat. So that was the ticking noise. My stepfather, being the spiritual and the traditional Native American man he was, smudged the house with sweet grass and everything just seemed to stop. To this day, I don't feel normal. I feel the little darkness that entered my entire body. I feel that energy that took over all my motor functions for those 15 minutes and I still wonder to this day, why didn't my grandmother and little sister wake up? Were we in the other world? Were we hidden for the torture the spirit world would make us endure? Why did it only come after my brother? Will I feel like this forever? I do believe in the paranormal, considering that I've had a little experience with it throughout my childhood. Most of them have been harmless, which I can post about later, but these two experiences were different. I'm not sure how to explain them. Now, the first encounter happened to me about five years ago when I was in high school. Now, I'd like to say that I've never experienced sleep paralysis in my life. I do have depression and anxiety, but not so severe to cause this. We were in a new house that we moved into about a year prior to this experience. 
The house isn't very old, and nothing really was creepy about it, so I never considered something paranormal could happen here. But one night, when I was sleeping a dreamless sleep, I suddenly couldn't breathe. Still asleep, I could feel pressure on my neck and was gasping for air. I finally was choked into waking up, sitting up straight and grabbing my phone to flash around the dark room to see if someone had broken in. I was alone. I was still gasping for air when I pointed the light at the foot of my bed, and that's when I saw it. It was a small creature, maybe about three feet tall, with grayish, slimy skin. It was scrawny, and its face was round, but it had no eyes, only a mouth with sharp teeth. It was creepily moving under my bed as it hissed at me and disappeared. I sat in absolute shock, still trying to breathe. Let's just say I couldn't sleep that night. I called my boyfriend at the time, having a panic attack and still struggling to catch my breath. I'm not sure what that was, and thankfully I hadn't seen it since. I knew that it wasn't a dream because I sat up and had my phone on. I was fully aware of what had happened. I also realized that my blanket or anything else couldn't have choked me since it was at the far end of my bed. I have read once that when people feel like they are falling in a dream, it's because a demon is choking you and that's why you jolt awake. But I didn't have that falling feeling, which I do experience a lot. This was different. I was so full of fear. What if I hadn't woken up? Has anyone else experienced this before or at least known what this is? My second experience happened a couple of weeks ago. I'm home from college for the summer and I'm staying with my parents. This is still the same house that my last experience had occurred in. Again, this takes place in my room when I was sleeping. It was roughly around 1am when in my dreams I got this intense pain in my stomach, like I was going to be sick and my insides would be ripped out. It was such a strong pain that it jolted me awake. I was still feeling sick but I also got this intense feeling of dread. I rolled over and looked at the ceiling. I froze. There was this dark grey blotch on my ceiling that almost looked like TV static, and in the dead center was a face, the eyes dark, small, and hollow, with what I can only describe as a Jack the Pumpkin King grin. It was close to me, and then slowly retracted back into the ceiling. I grabbed my phone and shone the light upwards. Nothing. I was in a trance for what seemed like an hour, but could only be a couple of seconds. Then I felt a buzz from my phone. It was from my ex, who I was not on great terms with at all. I had been trying to avoid this abusive guy, but I guess I had unblocked him at some point. He asked if I was up. Since I still had the sick and dreadful feeling and due to the fact that I'm trying to trust my gut more, I asked him if everything was okay. He did have some drinking issues and I still care about people that don't really care about me. Then, to my horror, he said he was outside my house and wanted me to come outside to take a ride and talk. Uh, no. I knew this guy and if I ticked him off enough, he'll get violent. I wasn't getting in the car with him and since I still felt this overwhelming pain in my stomach, I told him to buzz off. He eventually left and I couldn't sleep for a long time. I just felt like I was being watched and also the sick feeling didn't go away for hours. I would have passed this as my body's instincts telling me that there was danger around, but the face in my ceiling makes me think otherwise. I haven't experienced this since then, but then again I haven't spoken to my ex pretty much either. I'm not sure what is going on, and I'm terrified since they have actually caused some sort of harm to me. I just want answers, and if someone knows what these beings are or have a similar experience, please let me know. I'm just scared that these things will come back and finish what they started. So I was raised in a pagan family. We believe in spirits and ghosts, but we also believe that there are different kinds that come to bring messages or omens. If you don't get the messages the first time, it's likely they will keep coming back until you do. But that wasn't the case in this story. The message wasn't heeded and they never came back. The following is a true story from my mum who encountered wanderers. 
Back in the 80s, before I was even a thought in my mom's head, she was around 14 years old. She would hang with the kids in her neighborhood, and they had all formed a very close-knit group over the years. The day Wanderers appeared was much like any other. My mom had hung out with her friends, eaten dinner, showered, and gone to bed. She was sleeping soundly when there was a knock at the front door. She was annoyed having been woken up at 4 a.m. She laid in bed not wanting to get up and hoping that whoever was at the door would go away. That didn't happen. Ten minutes later, the knocking still persisted. My mom groggily went to the front door and opened it to see the most bizarre sight. A man and woman in a wedding attire stood in front of the door while a car boasting a sign with the words, Just Married, was parked in front of our family's locked gate. Uh, yeah? My mom said. The woman spoke first. David needs you. The woman promptly pointed at my mom's friend's house, who lived just across the street. Uh, okay, I'll be sure to check on him in the morning. My mom went to close the door before the man interjected sharply. He needs you now. My mom stared at the couple blankly before asking them why, but the only thing that they would say is that David needs her. He needs her now over and over again. Finally, she caved in and said, Okay, I'll get my shoes and I'll head over. The couple stared at her as if waiting for her to get her shoes. Do you need something else? She asked. You will go to him? The woman asked. Yes, I'll go to him. My mom replied. With that, the couple looked at each other and turned around to walk away. My mom closed and locked the door, then quickly looked out the window to make sure the two strange people were in fact leaving. It had only been a few seconds between her closing the door and her looking out the window, but the couple in their car was gone. She was confused how they'd gotten into the yard with the gate locked, gotten out so quickly, and why she hadn't heard their car start or drive away. But these were questions she could ponder later in the morning because right now she was tired and needed to go back to sleep. So that's what she did. She went back to her room and crawled into bed. Around 7.30 a.m., my grandmother went into my mom's bedroom and woke her up. The look on my grandmother's face was pained as she stroked my mom's hair. Baby, she said, not really knowing how to say it. Your friend David, he's dead. My mom was distraught because David was one of her best friends. His house was where all the children in the neighborhood would go after school. His mom would let them listen to loud music and play games. She had just seen him the day before. How could he be dead? Early that morning, David's mother went to wake her son up for breakfast. It was a Saturday. He was going to eat, shower, and hang with his friends. But, but when she walked into his room, she instead found her son's dead body. The police ruled that it was self-inflicted. However, no one believed it because of the circumstances he was found in and the fact that David was always the happiest kid without a care in the world. He would talk about his future and dreams so passionately. His personality was said to be electric. David was found naked, with a bag over his head and a belt that didn't belong to him tightened around his neck. His hands were tied behind his back and his bedroom window was open. The Wanderer's message made sense only after it was too late. My mom never forgot that morning. She never stopped blaming herself for her friend's death. Strangely, after that, the kids in the neighborhood would still go to David's house after his death. They loved his mom, and having them there helped her grief. For the first two weeks after his death, David's favorite song would echo throughout the house, but no one could ever find the source of where it was coming from. His mom sold the house shortly after and moved. My mom never saw the wanderers again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. 
And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.